section 5.1. So for a long time, or maybe not a long time, but for a while, it's going to seem that the material we're doing is totally unrelated to the material we spent the first 13 weeks or whatever doing. Eventually, everything is going to tie together. But we want to discuss the area under a curve. So, to clarify, this is the normal way of saying that, area under a curve. But what we really mean is the area between a curve and the x-axis. And area, we, I mean, the, the standard geometric understanding of area, like how much paint would it would be require to paint that region. And again, even though we say under, I mean, obviously, if we took that literally, there would be an infinite amount of area, but we don't mean that. We mean the area stuck between the curve and the x-axis. So this area is different. Um, from the area we're used to in one pretty significant way, which is that unless we have some kind of word problem, this area is unitless. I mean, ordinarily, if you say an area, you can't say a room has an area of 20. I mean, 20 what? 20 square feet, 20 square yards. But here we can say that the area under a curve is 20 without any explanation or any units attached to that number. Because of the way let me throw a word in here. Because we're talking about the area trapped between the curve and the x-axis, we want the curve to always be above the x-axis. And we'll give applications of this um, later in the semester, we'll give applications of this in the calculus too. Let me at least state a classic application of this so that it doesn't seem like a completely bizarre and completely foreign thing to do. The area under, come on, under a velocity curve is, let's say, under a speed curve to keep this positive, the area under a speed curve is the distance an object travels. So if you look at a car, for example, and you have a speed curve that may be a 
looks like this. You accelerate, you at some point get stuck at a stoplight and you have to stop. Then you go up, you get stuck behind a slow car, you have to slow down, but eventually you get up to 60 miles per hour and you just stay at 60 miles per hour until you arrive at your destination. If this is the velocity of a car, we can ask, well, how far does the car travel? And the distance that the car travels is the area under this curve. So this isn't just pure geometric nonsense. This does have real applications. And we'll see further applications, as I say, um, as we progress through the course and progress through calculus too. But for now, We'll put a question on the board and then almost immediately abandon it. The question we'll put on the board is, so if we have this positive curve, how do we find the area? And the answer at the moment is that we don't. That question is too hard for us. So We'll ask an easier question. If finding the area is too hard, could we at least approximate the area? And this we can do. And it's a pretty tedious process. We're not going to do this a lot in this course, but we should at least see the approximation process. And the approximation process uses a tool called Riemann sums. And here's how Riemann sums work. Let me get my calculator loading so I'll be able to refer to it when necessary. Let's say we have a function a positive function on some closed interval. Maybe on the interval from one to five. Well, on one to five, the natural logarithm looks something like this. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this interval from one to five, and we're going to cut it into pieces. And the exact 
number of pieces we're not going to worry about at this point. And the exact way we cut this into pieces, we're not going to worry about. But maybe, I mean, maybe just for this example, we cut this interval into an equal number of pieces. We're now going to use these pieces to create the rectangles. And the specific way I'm going to do this is by using the center of each interval. So like the center of this interval here, is 2.5. And I said I'm going to create a rectangle. I'm going to draw a line right up until I hit the curve. And then I'm going to draw a horizontal line segment. I'm also going to draw line segments up from two and three. And I'm going to create a rectangle in that fashion. And the observation I want to make here is that the area of this rectangle is pretty close to the area under the curve on the interval from two to three. Because look, we want the area under the curve, right? We want the area of this region. If you compare that to the area of the rectangle, the area of the rectangle is just a little bigger. The area of the rectangle has this little piece up here that isn't under the curve. But aside from that little piece, this area is the area we want. So this area is an approximation of the area we want. And we can find the area of a rectangle. That's like elementary school stuff. The area of a rectangle is its base times its height. Let's, I uh, got a little carried away, didn't I? So let me see, let's get this back. Art, stop erasing stuff. The, uh, the curve looked kind of like that. And I used this center of the curve. I used the center of the curve to create a rectangle. And I was talking about using the area of this rectangle to approximate the area under the curve. And the base of this rectangle is one. What about its height? Well, this is the natural log of x. To create 
this rectangle, I started at down here at 2.5, and I went up until I hit the curve. In other words, I went up until I reached the natural log of 2.5. And that makes the area of this little region, of this little rectangle, one times the natural log of 2.5. Does everybody buy this? Does anybody have questions or concerns? So this term here, is the area of this rectangle, which is supposed to approximate the area under the natural logarithm. And so that's just completely invisible. It's only an approximation because of this region up there. That region is included in the rectangle, but it isn't under the curve. Other than that, this and the area we're looking for are the same. And now we can repeat that process. In this little interval, we can select the midpoint. 3.5, and we can go up until we hit the curve. We can draw in a horizontal line segment. And we can look at the area of this rectangle. And the area of this rectangle is supposed to approximate the area under the curve. And it's only, once again, it's only an approximation. I don't know how well you can see this in like the back of the room, but there's a little region here that is, um, how to say this? There's a little region here that is in the rectangle, but is not under the curve. And conversely, there's, it looks like there's a little sliver here that's under the curve, but isn't in the rectangle. So the area under the curve and the area under that rectangle aren't identical, but this does look like it's a pretty good approximation. I mean, if you looked at the rectangle and you take the area of the rectangle, you are doing a fairly good job of approximating the area under the curve. And the height of this is a natural logarithm. 
and the base of this is one. So the area of this rectangle is one times the natural log of 3.3. .3. Why would it be 3.3? 3? Um, because to create this, to create this rectangle, I used the point midway between the, this three and this four. So I used this midpoint, which is, oh, or if you were, what you were really asking was why not 3.5? And you're right, that was a typo, thank you. So then we can repeat this process. We can go to 4.5 and we can create a rectangle. and use the area of this rectangle to approximate the area under the curve. We can do the same thing here. And our approximation here is going to be a lot more suspect. We'll once again use the mid we're midway between one and two. And unlike the previous cases, um, this rectangle is doing a pretty indifferent job <laughs> of approximating the area under the curve. This rectangle contains a fairly large region that isn't under the curve. And this rectangle is then missing a, a region that isn't under the curve. And the situation isn't as bad as it might look because those missing areas are kind of canceling each other out. We have area that we don't want while we're missing area that we do want. So the area, the extra area and the missing area are hopefully casting themselves out a bit. But in any, at any rate, the area of this rectangle is our approximation or the area under the curve, whether it's a good approximation, whether it's a bad approximation, it's the approximation that we have at the moment. And you'll notice that we've written down a sum here. We found the areas of these rectangles and we've added them all together. And this is how we've approximated the area under the curve. And this is an example of our Riemann sum. So if we can try to present Riemann sums in slightly more generality. 
Let me for now, let me make the observation that this Riemann sum could do a better job of approximating the area under the curve if we were willing to have more or different intervals. So let's go back. Let's go back. To the observation I made. That this rectangle doesn't seem to be doing a great job of estimating the area under the curve. I could make it do a better job if I were willing to have more rectangles. Angles. What if we took this single rectangle and we broke it into four pieces? And for each of these pieces, we then repeat this process. Take the midpoint. Go up, create a rectangle. Take the midpoint, go up, and create a rectangle. Take the midpoint, go up, create a rectangle. Take the midpoint, go up, <clears throat> and create a rectangle. So this region in green, this region in green is supposed to be approximating the area under the curve. And it is still just an approximation. We're getting stuff that we want, we're missing stuff that we don't want. It's certainly not a perfect approximation, but it's a better approximation than we had a while ago when we just had one interval. So in general, let me write this down. The more intervals you use and the smaller the intervals are the closer the Riemann sum will come to approximating the area under the curve. So Riemann sums are an approximation, but they're an approximation that can be made better by modifying the Riemann sum. 
And this is a situation, if you cast your mind back, very similar to the derivative. When we introduced this idea of the instantaneous rate of change, we said, oh, well, we can approximate instantaneous rates of change using average rates of change. And then we can make our average rates of change better and better and better, and they'll get closer and closer and closer until in the limiting case, our average rates of change can be used to define the instantaneous rate of change. And we're going to do something very similar with the Riemann sum. We'll, um, we make this observation as the intervals get more and more and more numerous, and as they get smaller and smaller and smaller, the Riemann sums get closer and closer and closer to being the area that we want. And ultimately, we're going to define the area under the curve to be a limit of Riemann sums. But we, uh, that we might do that tomorrow. We need a little more notation first. Let me, I mean, I've demonstrated a Riemann sum. I haven't really formally defined it. <clears throat> So let's make sure we're all on the same page here. We have an interval from A to B, and we have some positive curve on the interval, and we want to create a Riemann sum. Well, the first thing we do is break the interval into pieces. These pieces don't have to be equally um, sized, although they often are. but we break our interval into pieces. Then in each of these pieces, select a value. And it can be any value. In the previous example, we always used the midpoint of the piece. And I'm pretty sure I need to take a look at the quiz. I'm pretty sure that's what we're doing in the quiz too. I tell you how many pieces. I tell you what the pieces are. I say, use the midpoint of each piece. But it could be any point you want. In the second piece, maybe we'll select a point way over there. In this third piece, maybe we select a point way over here. We could even select the end points. For this fourth piece, maybe we select an end. But at any rate, we select a point in each of these pieces, and then we use 
fears of our viewers to create rectangles. And we do that by drawing line segments straight up. Like so. <clears throat> Work with me. And now, once we have these rectangles, we add together the areas of the rectangles. So the number that you get after you add together the area of the rectangles is ultimately going to depend on the decisions you made, right? I mean, I could have used different intervals in step one, where I broke this thing into pieces. I could have used different pieces. Even after I'd selected my pieces, I could have used a different value in each piece, like here, here, let's get that uh, axis back. I could have used this value in the first piece. And if I'd used that value, I would have got in a different rectangle. Um, so the Riemann sum depends on all of these facts. And again, in the quiz, I tell you how to make the choices. I say, okay, we want all of these intervals to be the same size, and we want to select the midpoint of each of the pieces. I give that information. I mean, it's kind of necessary if we're going to have a multiple choice quiz, there has to be just one correct answer. But um, the details of the Riemann sum are ultimately not really going to matter as far as the area under the curve goes. Because as I say, what we're ultimately going to be doing is taking a limit. And when you take the limit, all of these details will be sort of swept under the rug. Even so, this is stuff, this is important. This is like, no, you're not going to be computing a lot of Riemann sums by hand. But once we start moving into applications, that, that will probably be next semester. But once we started moving into applications, you're going to be able to, you're going to need to be able to recognize a Riemann sum when it occurs. Okay, and I believe that's it for this section. Next section is brief, as I say, but we are covering it Tuesday, whether you, I mean, 
by formal policy, it's obvious that everyone should attend all my classes. Um, if you don't attend because you're going home early, you're still responsible for the material. So that will be section uh, section 5.3 tomorrow. Yes. Will there be two quizzes someday? There will be. And yeah, the quiz, the quiz uh, deadlines are the same, even though, you know, there's this break and everything. Maybe just mm -hmm. try to get those done Tuesday so you don't have to worry about them over the long weekend. Uh, if you could all slide your tests that away. 